Our reading from today is from Hebrews 10 in English Standard Version. But recall the former days when, after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion for the, on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. This is God's word. Please be seated. So what all of you do not get during a children's message is you do not see these faces. You hear the words, but I assure you the faces that are staring back as they said that I love more God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit and my family were absolutely sincere. And as one says it, they look and they nod and they agree. So um, I don't know what you're doing, but uh, there is an enormous amount of sincerity there because they really believe that. So now it's our turn. What do you love? What is it that you love? Um, it may differ between... Uh, different individuals. I do think that what we love does become evident to those around us. Uh, we, people see a priority. There are things that we press into. There are things that we pursue. Um, we tend to chase what we love. We tend to pursue it. We'll go after it. We'll make sacrifices in order to get it. I really appreciated a post this week by Dave Harvey that talked about storm chasers, that they chase these storms. I will not guarantee the authenticity of any of these pictures. <laughs> the thing that's fascinating about storm chasers is obviously it's dangerous, but the danger doesn't dissuade them. The danger actually seems to draw them in. They seem to go after it. As everyone else is going away, they're coming out. They're willing to risk everything. Why? Because they love being in the presence. They want to get there and be in the presence and see the storm. We chase what we love, even if it seems foolish to those around us. So, what are you chasing? Who are you chasing? Over time, have you become more committed to the chase or less committed to the chase? Some of you came to this community and you were chasing after a certain major or a career. And maybe now you're thinking, I don't know if I want to continue in this chase. I don't know if I want to continue to pursue it because it may be taking longer than you think. Or maybe you've actually caught it and you're ready to release it because it's not as pleasing as you had hoped. So we're always asking this question, how long are we going to continue this chase? How far will we run? When will we listen to that voice inside that's saying, enough, enough. It's not worth it. You've risked too much. You've sacrificed too much. Enough. Today, we will complete Hebrews 10, and we'll hear more of what faith in Christ looks like. 
We have spent three weeks in Hebrews 10 because Hebrews 10 sets us up well for Hebrews 11. If you read Hebrews 11, apart from Hebrews 10, you may never understand Hebrews 11. We have to ask this question, what is faith? If you're going to fill that out, faith is, what would you say faith is? There are two common answers that you'll hear today about what faith is. One's willingness to sufficiently believe in the power of God to bring personal gratification, health, healing, prosperity, peace, good grades, into the lives of believers. That if we believe this enough, if we cling tightly to this enough, then it'll happen. That's faith. There's a different definition, one you get from Hebrews 10, that would say faith is the endurance to persevere as we wait for God's fulfillment of the promise of eternal life in Jesus Christ. Now, I, you've got to recognize how huge the difference is between these two definitions. Do you believe A? Do you believe B? Do you think A and B somehow can be together? You don't like either A or B. You will agree with A or B depending on your point in life and whoever you happen to be listening to at the time. The thing is, A is speaking of grasping more tightly to the things that we want in this world. If we can squeeze and hold on to them tight enough and beg loud enough, then we'll get them. B talks about how we are to hold more loosely to the things in this life to have a singular purpose to chase after the one thing that we actually really love. So our outline this morning, we'll talk about pursuing the promise. And we'll see him tell them to recall the excitement, how they felt as they first believed, and then to press on through this difficult time, press on to the reward, and not recoil from this chase. And I would ask, I would encourage everyone in here to set in your mind as you start what it is that you're chasing. You don't have to all answer like the children did. There may be aspects or things in your life that you may be chasing after. What are you chasing? Is it Christ? Are the things you're chasing, are are they for Christ? This is a harder question, I think, than it would seem because there are things that I chase that I want to say it's for Christ. In reality, it may be for me so that I can get the applause of somebody around me. Is it antichrist? And I don't mean that you're chasing after the antichrist. I mean that you're chasing after something that is in absolute conflict with who Christ is and what God has revealed that he is calling us to do. And they're just incompatible. And as I ask this question, what am I chasing? What is going to be my measure? How am I going to decide what is the standard? Because if I'm constantly pursuing a way around God's revealed word, if I'm charting a course that again and again is crashing against the waves of God's command then who am I really chasing? We need to look at our career path. We need to look at our relationships that we're pursuing. We need to look at the hobbies that we're investing our time in. Maybe we need to assess the political agendas that we are so excited about. Maybe we need to assess our fears and our pleasures. What are we really chasing? John records this in his gospel in John 12. Many of the authorities believed in Jesus, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it so they would not be put out of the synagogue. See, there was a cost. There was a cost in pursuing Jesus. For they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. They wanted other people to still like them. They wanted the affirmation of those around them. So they tried to believe in Jesus in silent 
but not tell anybody. There's a cost. There's a cost in loving Christ. And so, for the Hebrews, it's come to this point where they're being asked again to pay a great cost if they are going to continually love Christ. And they're told, friends, first, let's recall your excitement. Recall the excitement. It's really a a call to tell and retell the story of the chase. There are things that you chase after. There are things that make you really excited. And if you have stories about that, you like to tell them, and you like to retell them, and you like to get together with people that know your stories, and you just continually retell them to one another. And it doesn't matter that everyone's heard them because they're so exciting. They're so much fun because they're revealing something about you. They're revealing what you love. And you all get together and you do this. We share stories and pictures to relive what we love. We want to tell the story again. And I don't think he's calling them to do this. There's no note of sadness or despair. He's saying, no, get together and do this with vigor. Get together and remind yourselves of what you were so excited about. You know, if in our memories struggle was a part of it, it's all the better. It's all the better. It's evidence that we were actually chasing after something that we truly loved. In our family, as our kids were growing up, it was all those stories about camping because it was always pouring down rain and it often came in sheets. And you would hear cars packing up and leaving, but we stayed We stayed. We're going to tough it out. Why? Because we love camping. It was its stories about going to Cottonwood Pass in Colorado on August 1st and snow falling on the tent and it starting to collapse. And it was so cold that all the water that we had froze solid. But we stayed. Dad, we don't want to go sleep in a motel. Why? We love camping. So we're going to go through this struggle. They loved Christ. They had been enlightened. They no longer lived in darkness. Recall a minute a time when you were enlightened. Maybe you were at camp. Maybe you're on a missions trip. Maybe it's something you heard someone say. Maybe it's a book that you read and you're enlightened. Is that simply an emotional moment Or has a material change actually taken place within you? How will you know? You'll know by how you respond to the other things in your life, in your world. Recall the former days when you were enlightened, when you endured a hard struggle with suffering. Relive those exhilarating memories and no longer live in the darkness. The passage goes on. He reminds them that they were previously publicly exposed to reproach and affliction. And sometimes that happened to their friends, their family members. They were partners with those that were so treated. They had compassion on those in prison. And they joyfully accepted the plundering of their property. They were asked to loosen their grip on the things that they grasped tightly in the world so that they could continue their chase after Christ. And they were ready to endure this hardship. They did not recoil at this call to suffer. They did not hesitate to cease pursuing their own will to chase after the will of God. And the writer's offering them this incomplete list to help stir up their minds, to cause them to relive those memories, remember those feelings that you had. There was public reproach and affliction. You had emotional and physical harm because of the singular pursuit of Christ, but you did it anyway. You lost your property. Your possessions were confiscated because you wouldn't loosen your grip on Christ, but you let him take them away anyway. You lost your liberty. You were imprisoned. You exchanged your liberties for Christ because you refused to be silent. And more than that, you did it joyfully. 
You accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. The truth is they knew this was an uneven exchange. (laughs) Joke's on you. Because they're releasing the lesser to grasp the greater. They traded the temporary. They traded what was fleeting, their freedom, their property, their public honor, for the one eternal abiding possession, eternal life in Christ's kingdom. Now, this is their story, and he's calling them to relive their story. He wants it to be retold. So what is our story? Are there things that we're gripping too firmly? Are there things that we may be asked to release if we're going to continue the chase? These stories are not stories about what they did, about how strong they were. They're simply the evidence that the promise is worth risking at all. The promise is more valuable than all the other things that they had. It's a reminder that the chase at times will be dangerous, it will bring grief, and it will fill our hearts with joy. It will release us from other things that we may be pursuing. And though we may not know the route, we do know the final destination. We do not know where this will lead us but we know ultimately where it will end up. So press on to the reward. Do not stop. Now, it seems for the Hebrews that their confidence was beginning to wane, that their pace is slowing, that there is that voice inside that's saying, enough, it's time to stop, it's time to step back, it's time to watch from a distance where it's a little more safe. We don't know what was tempting these believers to halt. The picture seems to be that shortly after they came to faith, there was persecution, there was suffering, but then they entered into a time of peace. But now the persecution is returning. And this is what we read. Do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. This is an appeal to not dull or bury or explain away or forget the promise as the pain now returns. The reproach resumes and the pace quickens. There are voices that are likely challenging their convictions. There are voices that are tempting them to slow down in your pursuit. Wait it out. Be reasonable. Maybe you need to tamp down the fires of your love a bit. They can't continue at this pace. Honestly, is this renewed persecution, is it really worth the new risk? Maybe they've become secularized by peace. It happens. Historically, Christians prosper in persecution and they secularize in peace. And we pray for peace. I'm not sure we shouldn't, but it does tell us something about us. In this storm, believers chase God. When times are difficult, when things are falling apart, we chase God. When peace returns, we can chase the world. It is the cycle of the book of Judges, and we point at it and say, how could they be like that? I look at my life, and I'm like, I think I'm in Judges. As believers, we will be tempted to forsake God's will to chase our own will when our will seems attainable. We will forsake God's will to chase after our will when our will seems attainable. In times of peace, our will seems attainable. When everyone is persecuting you, it doesn't seem attainable, and so we pursue God's will. But in times of peace, we may search for a route around God's word. There's got to be a loophole in here somewhere. 
We may create a barrier to wall out God's commands. But God, in His wisdom, because of His mercy, He's going to lead us into some reproach. He may lead us into imprisonment. He may lead us to a loss of possessions or liberty to renew our hearts so that we will pursue Him alone because we will chase after what we love. The passage goes on, and there's kind of a melding between a verse in Isaiah and Habakkuk 2. We read, Yet for a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. The passage from Isaiah 26 is just telling them it will be a little while. This will not last forever. When we're called into reproach or suffering, it won't be forever. We don't know how long it'll be, but it won't be forever. It'll be for a little while. A little while means not for eternity. Isaiah 20, 26, 20. Come, my people, enter your chambers and shut your doors behind you. Hide yourselves for a little while until this fury has passed by. God will bring the suffering to an end when it's fulfilled its purpose. Habakkuk 2 is a little different story. Here in Habakkuk 2, Habakkuk is told how God will use the unrighteous to discipline the more righteous. It's the prophecy about the Babylonians that they will come and they will rule over Israel. It's going to happen and be patient, not puffed up toward God when it happens. We read this in Habakkuk 2. For still the vision, the vision is God's word that's been revealed to Habakkuk, awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. The one that says it isn't going to happen, the one that pushes back against God, his soul is puffed up. It's not upright within him. But the righteous shall live by faith. Now, I don't know if you've seen when little birds puff up. It is, it's just funny. That bird is probably not even half the size it looks in that picture. But it pulls its feathers out and it puffs up. So it looks big. looks bigger than it really is. It's doing that because it's afraid. It's afraid. And it puffs up and tries to be tougher than it can ever possibly be. We puff up in pride. We puff up in fear. God is sovereign. He may bring suffering. He may bring hardship to his people to turn them from their self-glorification and their liberties and possessions and freedoms back to pursuing him alone. In these verses, living by faith is being contrasted with shrinking back in fear. Live by faith. Fear God. Live for his pleasure, even when it's difficult. But if one is to shrink back in cowardice, then we're fearing man. I'm living for my own pleasure. We chase what we love. And God is jealous for our love. He's not willing to share it with anyone or anything else. So, do not recoil from the chase. Now, you can't see it that clearly. This guy's done. He's ready to recoil. It's time to get out of here. This guy's not done yet. He's not ready to recoil from the chase. We read again, going back to verse 38. My righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. They're shrinking back because of a loss of affection. They're finding that they do love some of the things that they're afraid they're going to lose. They love them more than they love Christ. There's always going to be a challenge for our affections as believers. 
the things we cherish in this world versus the things that Christ is calling us to in his kingdom that are not of this world. The promise will be received by those who complete the chase, singularizing their affections on Christ alone. If we recoil, we're loving something more than we love Christ. As we choose our lives, as we choose our desires, as we choose our dreams, our liberty, our property, our freedoms, then we're standing in judgment of the promise. We're saying the promise of Christ simply is not worth the chase. But if we press on, as things are taken from us, then we validate the promise. We say it is worth it. And then our souls will be preserved in Christ. What is going to tempt you to stand in judgment of the promise? To say, maybe this promise isn't as valuable as I thought. What is going to tempt you to recoil from the chase? The truth is, you really don't know. But God does know. God knows your heart. God knows what will tempt you to recoil. And as I come to understand it, I may deny it, but that doesn't matter. God still knows because God knows the heart. And I believe that he will bring that very thing before me because he is jealous of my love. I enjoy when we're doing premarital counseling and we get to the point where we talk about jealousy. And everyone thinks that jealousy is just this horrible thing, but that's not the way Scripture talks about jealousy. God is jealous because He does not want to share our love with another who will destroy us. If our love is strain after something else that something else will destroy us so God is a jealous God and he wants all of our love he is not willing to share us God loves me enough to expose my straying eyes and my wandering heart to me to protect me from me he needs to show it to me so that I can confess it to him he already knows anyway What is it that is going to tempt my eyes? What is it that's going to cause my heart to wander that I may love something or someone more than I would love Christ? God alone knows, and he must bring that and show that to me so that then I will know. And I can confess that before him. That is what's happening to these Hebrews. The word came to them. They fell in love with Christ. They gave up everything. They pursued it. They matured into a time of peace. And that time of peace is coming to an end. And now the persecution is back. Are there things in the time of peace that they have come to grip too tightly that they need to be ready to release? If they're going to pursue the promise they need to recall the excitement that they had when they first received the good news. They need to press on toward that one reward and not recoil from the chase. So what am I chasing? Do I know what that is? Do I know what that is? I already asked, is it Christ? Is it for Christ? Is it against Christ? How am I going to answer that question? What is going to be the measure? What's my standard? This isn't tricky. This isn't complex. This isn't confusing. The problem is it's just too clear. It's just too clear. And so as I work so hard and I invest so much plotting a pathway around God's revealed words, when I circle people, create a circle of people around me so that together we can chart a course that breaks against wave after wave of God's clear commands, 
it's highly unlikely that it is Christ that I'm pursuing. What he calls us to is pretty clear. It's not that confusing. What we have to ask ourselves is, what assurance do we have that when we catch this other thing that we're chasing, that it will deliver what it is promised? How many of you have chased something for a long time? Maybe it is a major. You don't have to confess here in front of everybody. But you've chased something, and you knew that once you caught it, this was, I mean, your life would never be the same again. Once you got that new car, once you got that first motorcycle, once you actually visited this place, maybe once you married this person, you'd go, wow, this will be it. It'll deliver everything. And it didn't. It didn't deliver what it promised. What's going on? There's, there's a voice inside that tells us that if we will just pursue this thing, this is the one thing that's missing in my life, and if I could just pursue it, if I could just get that, I mean, if my kids would just behave, I mean, how hard can this be? If that just happened, then everything would be okay. The problem with all of those, I don't know what your experience is, this is just my personal confession, that if I chase after those things, it's right as soon as I touch him, but before I really grasp it wholly, there's this voice that goes, ha, fooled you again. Because it doesn't deliver. Christ alone delivers. Christ alone delivers. There's no relationship outside of Christ. There's no possession that you can get. There's no personal honor or glory. There's no political agenda that's going to come that is ever going to deliver what it promises. Except Christ alone. He said, let not your hearts be troubled about all these things that are happening. Just believe in God and believe in me. It's very clear. It's not that tricky. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? There is a plan. I am going, and there's a plan for you to be there too. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. I'm going to return and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. That's the promise. That's the promise that we're reading about in Hebrews. That is where the faith is focused. The faith is focused on can I endure when all the troubles are coming that may be small, may seem large. Can I endure during that time that I may be able to persevere in trusting that Christ will do what he said he will do? And if that isn't what we're trusting in, What else are we going to trust in? Who else are we going to trust in? We chase after what we love. We don't do it in isolation. I would encourage you to get together with family members and friends and just ask, well, what am I chasing after? Are there some things that you're chasing after that are going to end up empty, that are not going to be able to deliver? There probably are. But that's okay. God knows about those things. And as we reach and we grab them and we realize they're not what we thought, what do we do? We turn back and we go after Christ and Christ alone because he alone will deliver. Please bow your heads with me. Father, we thank you that you show us so clearly and so simply what it is that we're called to and, Father, we confess that it is hard. There are so many things that our heart wanders after. We create this smorgasbord that we just want to take a little of this and a little of that and a little of this. Father, teach us to be unreasonable. 